Six, we welcome in our next guest. He is the president of the West Virginia Education Association, Dale Lee. Dale, good morning. Great to have you on the program again. Good morning. Great to be here. And and next time I come in the station, it's going to be my birthday. I expect one of those cakes. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Even well, if it's not your birthday, it will be your birthday. I don't know, right? when, I don't know what it's going to be, but it's going to be my birthday. I want one of those cakes. Every day is your birthday. Okay, that's right. That's a new day, a new opportunity. And uh, as it goes, uh, Dale, with uh, teachers and uh, state workers here who are using PEIA, uh, they are uh, in for some very incredible increases in premium as the years go forward here. And it sounds like uh, some of these increases are unexpected in terms of the percentage of increase, Dale. Yeah. I mean, if you remember when two years ago when we had the 24.5% increase in premiums and they said, oh, this is needed to get us at the 80-20. And, and once we get it to 80-20, it's going to be – you know, everybody's going to know what's coming forth. Um, and then last year they passed Senate Bill 268 that uh, uh, gave the providers 110% of, of Medicare. And, and and while I readily admit that, that they needed that, uh, what it did is put a hole in the, in the budget. And the legislature in their special session – uh, a few weeks ago, had to go back and put $87 million in the reserve fund to get it at the statutory requirement of 10%. But to keep it at that, and they had to not only increase the premiums by 14% now, uh, they had to increase, dedu- or they're recommending, increasing deductibles, out-of-pocket costs, uh, and um out of pocket maximums and everything by forty percent. You know, when you look at that, that raises about seventy six point four million dollars of the of the hundred and thirteen million that's that's needed. Uh that's certainly not an eighty twenty split. Dale, I'm hearing rumors that state employees, maybe specifically teachers, are beginning to discuss the possibility of a strike over this. Are those rumors true? You know, it's it's too early to say. We we have a plan of action uh, to combat this, and the first step in that plan is to um, go to these public hearings. I think the the one in Martinsburg is uh, November twelfth. Uh, I plan to be at at all the the all five of the in person public hearings: Martinsburg, uh, Morgantown, Wheeling, Charleston, and Beckley. Um, and, and speak. You all know I come over to Martinsburg every year for this, mm-hmm. uh, but I expect it to be a lot more lively this year and with a lot more people showing up. This is at the Holiday Inn, 6 o'clock in the evening on November the 12th in Martinsburg. And is Fred Albert also going to be in attendance for that, uh, Dale? Uh, you know, I, I don't know that. Um, their convention will be that weekend, and, and I don't know if, if uh, preparing for that and everything, whether he'll get a chance to, to come over for that. I'll ask Fred. He'll be on the program tomorrow morning there. Bill? Yeah, uh, good morning, Dale. Uh, before we ask a question, last time you were here, uh, your daughter, had, your, where your daughter teaches, had a lockdown. Uh, yeah. I assume that was not, uh, nothing major coming out of that? Everything went well. It was uh, the the complex she's at. The middle school was right beside the high school, and it was actually uh, an issue they thought at the high school. So they locked down both schools, and everything went well. Okay. Well, that's good it, to hear. It, it followed the procedure exactly yeah. the way it's supposed to be followed, and, and everything was handled. Uh, no one was in danger. So that's that's always a relief. Yeah, it certainly is. Uh, there's uh, the merger between the two organizations. Uh, is that on schedule? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. We uh, uh, plan. We we've had several meetings. We plan to continue that. Uh, we we are uh, working on the constitution and bylaws now. Uh, we expect to have those ready and and start negotiating staff contracts sometime in January. Uh, and the vote of the two organizations will take place March 29th in Charleston. And how does that go? Does the vote have to be dissolved and then vote at the same time to absorb? 
Yeah, that's that's pretty much it. What will happen is is we will be in one room and uh, AFT convention will be in a in another room and there'll be a middle room that's empty. Uh, both organizations will meet at the same time and have the same discussion over dissolving the current organization. So we'll dissolve WBEA and they'll dissolve AFT West Virginia. Uh, and in in the new business item that will be presented, in addition to dissolving it, uh, they will then name the delegates at our delegate assembly in their convention delegates to the new organization. Uh, and uh, assuming that the vote goes like we expect, and that the two votes, two organizations vote to dissolve, then the two bodies will then meet in the middle room and they'll be the first uh, delegates to the first convention. I think we're calling it the representative convention of the new organization. And they will then adopt the name, the constitution bylaws and the, the transition officers. Now you and Fred have both been leaders of your particular organization for many, many, many years. Is there any possibility that one of the two of you will assume leadership of the new merged organization? Well, we'll I, I will be a part of the transition team. I, I really can't speak for yeah. Fred. Yeah. Uh, I will be a part of the transition uh, organization and, and we'll take them to their first convention. But there is absolutely zero possibility uh, when they have their first convention that, that I will be uh, uh, running for the president of the new organization. And I believe I'm old. I'm old. I'm <laughs> yeah, old. Yeah, that's right. I think Fred has taken the same position. So he has. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, Mr. Gilstrap. Yeah. Uh, good morning, Lee. Uh, Dale, excuse me. Um, I'm looking at the website here, and it says you first became president in on June 15th, 2008. And here we are, doing the math right, that's 16 years later. How have the issues changed? What were the big issues in 2008 as opposed to now? Oh, gosh. That, that's. Uh, uh, it's changed dramatically when, when I first became president. Um, uh, and when I say it's changed dramatically, in, in some ways it has, some ways it hasn't. We were still at that time uh, 47th, 48th, 49th in the nation in pay. Uh, we were still having uh, issues with funding for public schools. It, it was in about, oh, I'm thinking about 2010 that uh, – uh, then Democratic Senator Eric Wells first proposed the idea of charter schools, um, and and so we had that to battle back then. Uh, there were a lot of discussions uh, under the Governor Earl Ray Tomlin. There was a lot of changes in, in education. Uh, if you recall, in, in Governor Manchin, when he was governor instead of Senator Manchin, and his second administration is when uh, – the federal government went to the uh, race to the top, and uh, everybody was moving toward uh, a grant base instead of a needs-based funding. And people all over the nation, states all over the nation, were dictating that 50% of a teacher's salary and, and evaluation be based on test scores. Uh, I'm proud to say that we, we fought that in West Virginia, and we were one of the only states that, that didn't adopt that. Uh, we had it that it would only be 3% of a valuation, and it couldn't cause anyone to be unsatisfactory. And what we find a couple of years later is that, that that model didn't work, and all the other states were moving toward the model that we had. So so we had battles then, uh, and, and I, I call it the uh, – uh, we had an education summer that year where the Senator Manchin's plan didn't we didn't pass and uh, with wanting to do the race to the top. So we had a education summit all summer. I, I was uh, in more meeting rooms that summer than ever before, and and we we resolved it. We worked things out, uh, and that's that's one of the things that I'm hopeful for this new legislature. Uh, we have some people who who are uh, may not always agree with the ideas that we have as as the WVEA, but are willing to listen and and willing to work on con uh, compromises. I mean, you look at people like uh, Delegate Wayne Clark, Delegate uh, 
Hornby and, and even Delegate Larry Kump, who who uh, been a strong supporter on PEIA. And while we all we don't agree on every issue, we we our goal is to do what's best for the students of West Virginia. Uh, and, and so I'm hopeful that we can we can work together and, and really do some good things. I, I think uh, Rob even has has changed his stance on the locality pay and understanding that uh, um, the reduction of local shares is is really uh, the thing to to do. And and with these increases in PEIA, that's even more prevalent because you could reduce the local shares, get get more of your tax pay dollars back there and use that money to offset these increased costs in, in health insurance. Now, hold on there, Dale. <laughs> hold on there, Dale. You're putting words in my mouth. Uh, let, I thought I heard that the last time I was there. It's it's uh, an option, right? It's an option. If you can't, you yeah, know, they say if you, if you can't get something one way, you got to look at it in another way. That, that's exactly right. right. That's exactly right. And, and I should have said, while we know that locality pay has little chance to pass, because of the other 55 counties, this reduction in local shares has a chance to pass because theoretically every county would benefit. If you can get to where you want to get to uh, safely, then the better path is the one to take as opposed to banging your head against a wall that isn't going to give. So yeah. if that's what now, it see, takes, bro, that's what it takes. See how you, how you transition into that? Referees <laughs> never would agree with me like that. I couldn't understand that. <laughs> Hey, I want to go. I want to go back to uh, to PEIA, uh, Dale, and the cost increases that are taking place because all of us who pay for health care know the price goes up exorbitantly, mm -hmm. well in excess for whatever reason, the cost of inflation. All right. So the 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 points have been made by legislators we have interviewed who have said what we need to do is for the state to get out of the insurance business with PEIA and privatize PEIA. Let the teachers, uh, unions negotiate the contracts or whatever, uh, but we, we, need to, we need to get out of this business because it's not sustainable. What are your thoughts on privatizing? And, and let me tell you why that's a bad idea. Uh, in, in essence, PEIA is, is quasi-privatized right now in mm -hmm. that uh, we, we bid out to uh, uh, providers on, on our health care and our, our uh pharmacy benefits and things like that. So it's not that the state's running that, that paying for all that themselves. They, they, they farm it out to, to companies. But the reason that's a bad idea is, number one, PEIA is, is an uh, uh, income-based premium. And very few insurance companies around, uh, I don't know of any privatized plans, where it's an uh, income-based premium, it's more of a, a, a user-based premium and that uh, those who are sickest pay the highest premiums uh, or a net that everybody pays the same amount. That's that's one of the reasons. Two is, uh, uh, you know, PEI has done a remarkable job on some things. In other words, we've capped insulin at $35. I don't know of any private plans that have been able to cap insulin at $35. Uh, another one is that um, we have balanced billing in West Virginia in, in PEIA. So if you have a, a procedure that costs $5,000 and, and PEIA pays $2,000 and, and then you pay your, your copay and deductible that's, that's arranged, the, they can't bill you for the balance uh, of that. Whereas in a private plan, you're responsible for the, 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 the rest of that. Uh, so, so there's those are just three examples of why privatization would be harmful to the employees, and, and um, you know, once we we get that information out, people see that. The major thing is, in PEIA, the administrative cost of the plan uh, is about seven point eight percent. It fluctuates between seven and and eight percent. In a private company, there are for-profit companies for a reason. And in a private plan, the administrative costs are more like 20%, with 80% going to, to the plan uh, costs and needs. Um, so a private privatization may come in in the, in the beginning and say, we, we can do it cheaper. And for the initial one, they can do it cheaper. But if you all have uh, 
uh, health plans there to station, just like we do at, at WVEA for our employees, you see that those costs may come in low one year, and then they gently start to rise over and over. Uh, and, and one person with one specific drug could really throw everything out of balance and change change the uh, the cost of it. Yeah, the the healthcare issue isn't in a vacuum. Of course, the entire country goes through it. Does sure. the cost are sure. so extraordinarily high? So I don't know that there is a fix to PEIA. I don't know that there is a solution that's going to uh, take care of healthcare costs for state employees because it's not isolated in West Virginia and certainly not isolated to PEIA. I've said that at every public hearing and at every finance board meeting. This is a national problem. It's not a problem that we can solve alone in West Virginia. While we can't solve it in West Virginia, we don't need to shift the cost to the employees the, the way we have in, in this plan. And um, a, a good example of how it's a national problem, you can't watch TV for an hour without seeing at least three to five uh, drug commercials you know, on, on the newest, greatest drug out there that, that's coming around. Well, that comes at a cost. Tell me why drugs in, in America cost sometimes more than 100 times more than they do in Canada or Mexico. Uh, it's because we're paying for that advertising cost, and, and that's just, just uh, wrong. That's a national issue that we have to address nationally. Bill? Yeah, uh, you mentioned insulin capped uh, $35, uh, uh, mm -hmm. and you gave credit to PEIA. I thought this was nationwide, that insulin was capped uh, everywhere at $35. Well, I, 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 I don't know that specifically. It may be a, it may be a federal law, but, but I know PEIA has capped it uh, uh, at least the last couple of years. Yeah, I think it's federal law. It's got. Uh, Dale, let's go back to uh, picking up on a question that uh, John Gilstrap asked earlier. And I'm going to use June the 15th, uh, 20, 2008, when you went, became president. Uh, we hear on the political arena all the time, are we better off today than we were four years so ago, four years ago? I'm going to ask the same thing. Are the teachers better off today than they were in June the 15th, 2008? Well, I was but a wee lad back then when I first took office. I, I was groping for any date. I can you can use any date you want to, but yeah, so yeah. I, I know, yeah, I know. Yeah. I, I really, yeah. uh, it, 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 the, these 17 years have gone by really quickly. Uh, in, in some ways, we were better off. In some ways, we were not. Uh, every every year and every administration is is different. Uh, every battle is different. Uh, uh, there, there are some things that that um, uh, there are those in in this legislature that are trying to address. I mean, we're trying to address the issue of of discipline. Uh, we just haven't been successful yet. We're not we're not addressing it in the in the what I believe is is the right manner in dealing with it in the mental and emotional health of the students at, at an early age, even in elementary school. But um, you know, look at look at what we've done with um, uh, putting the paraprofessionals, the the ECATs, in grades one through two right now, uh, kindergarten through two right now, and next year to be in third grade, so that we're giving these uh, kids a, a, an opportunity to to really get on grade level. We know that if kids are not on grade level by by third grade, they they start to really fail and, and fall behind even even more as they, as they progress. So this gives everybody a chance. Um, we've done a remarkable job with our, our, uh, our, our school nutrition programs. Uh, many counties provide free breakfast and, and, and lunch and, and have done a great job with, with that. Um, but we, we have problems that now that we didn't have when I first started and, and 2008, uh, we have uh, uh, ever increasing opioid epidemic for these kids, and and uh, we have the highest number of grandparents and, and non non parents raising these kids. I think it's about 53 percent of the kids don't live in a home with with uh, the traditional family as it is. Uh, so so we we have all these issues we have to address. So we have made some progress in areas. We've fallen behind in other areas. 
Uh, we dropped to 50th in the nation in pay, and, and I think when the, the rankings come out, you know, we, we will uh, probably stay somewhere around 50, uh, 49 or 50, and, and, and maybe drop, even after giving raises for the last five years. We're not staying competitive, uh, and the raises are not competitive with the surrounding states and other states' raises. Dale, I'm going to guess roughly half of the issues you just addressed um, from opioid epidemic to um, uh, foster care and such have to do with home life issues, sure, sure. which are completely outside the purview of any educational institution. 30 seconds. Do we have an opportunity to fix any of this problem? 30 seconds, Dale. Uh, well, we, we do, but everybody has to come to the table and figure out how we're going to do this. And, and uh, we have to provide uh, mental and emotional health for the students and, and help for the parents and, and the grandparents who are dealing with these kids and, and get them uh, the help that they need to. Dale, good to talk with you again. Thank you so much for your time this morning, sir. Great to talk to you. Thank you, guys. Thanks, and, Dale. And uh, I'm coming over on the 12th. Uh, if you want me on yeah. the 13th, I'm, I'll spend the night in, in Martinsburg and, and uh, well, at Inwood. I always stay at Inwood and, and uh, come on the 13th if you'd like. Works for me. Let's book it. Uh, and remember, that's my birthday. I expect to get it. <laughs> Back with the final minute now.